Next, we have um, Rebecca Green yeah, from the Ludwig Institute for Cancer Research. And she's going to be speaking about 4D high content imaging and automated phenotypic profiling of C. elegans embryogenesis. OK, thank you very much. And it's a pleasure to be here to tell you today about this large scale project that I've been spearheading for about the past five years. It's an ambitious project to functionally classify all of the genes that are required for embryonic development. Um, and for this project, we're doing high content screening. And I think some of the challenges we face in this will be broadly applicable, I hope. Uh, so we're studying embryonic development. And there are two main phases to development, cell fate specification and morphogenesis. And to capture these two main phases, we've built two custom engineered strains that capture uh, the endoderm, mesoderm, and ectoderm in the strain on the left using tissue-specific promoters to drive the expression of fluorescently labeled uh, histones. And on the right, we have um, a cell surface markers of the epithelia in green and the neurons in red. And this strain allows us to capture changes in cell shape during the course of development and changes in position of uh, the tissues throughout the course of development. We use these two strains in combination with the 2,000 genes that have previously been identified to be embryonic lethal in C. elegans. Um, these include 74% of the genes which are conserved and over 600 un undescribed conserved genes. Um, these, of course, are sort of low-hanging fruit for potential disease-relevant uh, genes. For the screen, we do RNAi directed against the 2,000 genes um, in the two strain backgrounds I just showed you. We inject double-stranded RNA, which we manufacture in-house, dissect out and recover embryos, array them on multi-well plates. Uh, we use a subset of the wells uh, to do this, and we image in three dimensions and in time, and we perform phenotypic analysis. And using this regime, we can collect between 80 and 100 embryos in a single overnight experiment uh, for 14 conditions. We have uh, completed data collection on this project, and we're still parsing through all the analysis, but we're getting close. Uh, so the output of this effort is we have a wide variety of different phenotypes. At the top, I'm showing you two control embryos. And throughout the slide, there's 24 different RNAi conditions that are arrayed. Uh, the goal of this project is quite simple. And that is that we just want to find conditions that look similar and put them into groups uh, or clusters, because phenotypic groups tend to be good indicators of functional groups. And um, I made this look very simple by shuffling around these images. But I just want to remind you that this is not 24 still images we're dealing with. We're dealing with 20,000 four-dimensional data sets that we need to, um, to analyze. So this is not your typical high content screen. And I just thought this would be a good moment to kind of pause and discuss where are some of the challenges that are specific to this type of project uh, relative to other high content screens. So most high content screens are sort of operating in this realm, where um, they're looking at a few features, maybe a single time point analysis. And in many cases, for simple systems, this is sufficient. Um, to get enough information to know what's going on in the biological process. Uh, and of course, this also has this inverse relationship with simplicity. So if you're working on a simple 2, 2D model, um, you can capture lots and lots of data and do the analysis quite quickly. We are, of course, on the opposite end of this complexity, which means that we have a lot of things to uh, deal with that many of you may not have to <laughs> when you're two-dimensional data sets. And that is that, that uh, some of the considerations include that we have a high number of dimensions. So the orientation of the sample is not something that uh, we can always control. So we have to deal with that in our features. Um, we have temporally evol evolving features, which means that time alignment and staging has to be precise in order for those features to be meaningful. We have very small ensemble sizes. So for each RNAi condition, we have between 5 and 10 embryos. So this really limits our ability to use machine learning applications and use averaging to deal with some of the noise problems if you don't get these things right in the uh, first step. And then we have a spectrum of continuous phenotypes. So the more complex data you have, the more features you're using, you can see that things really exist on a continuum. They don't fit neatly into bins. And so you want the, the ultimate readout to represent that. So these are some things just to bear in mind as I move forward. OK, so this is our challenge. And of course, uh, the big question is, how do we actually find phenotypically similar conditions from this data set? And um, we knew that doing this in a manual way was not going to be a tenable solution. It was not going to be as accurate. We wouldn't get all of the information, the unseeable things, out of our data set. 
but at the same time, um, we're biologists, so we don't really trust just throwing our data into a black box and trusting the outcome without knowing exactly what we're measuring. And so uh, we turn to a computer vision-based approach where uh, we harness the training and expertise of a biologist. We didn't actually have Solston on the project, but it would have been nice. <laughs> and we couple that with uh, custom computer algorithms that are measuring things that we know to be biologically meaningful. If we cluster together a number of those algorithms, then we give the computer the ability to see things that uh, are relevant to development and see things we want to see. So our approach was to select 500 of these 2,000 genes to um, first actually take a look at all of this data. We scored over 7,000 movies manually, and then this gave us a pretty good idea of the types of data that we have within the data set. So we could then develop many different automated analysis approaches and then check to make sure that these are actually doing a good job parsing and distinguishing between different features, uh, different phenotypes. And then the ultimate goal is, of course, to, to cut out the middleman here and then just apply the automated methods to the entirety of the data set. Um, so for our manual scoring, we scored each in individual embryo one at a time using um, points of arrest, tissue-specific measures. Um, so we get a very detailed readout in both strain backgrounds for each RNAi condition of the different types of problems that are occurring during the course of development. And then we took a subset of these uh, genes and we put them into phenotypic groups. These serve as sort of a proxy for our ground truth um, that we can then go on to use to evaluate our overall automated approach at the end. So I'll revisit this at the end. So of course, um, we wanted to develop automated methods to analyze this data and we wanted to capture the two main phases of embryonic development, cell fate specification and morphogenesis. And to look at cell fate specification, we use cell count. To look at morphogenesis, we monitor changes in tissue position and tissue shape. Both of these have the, uh, the advantage that we, they, we can do these in a rotationally independent way. Uh, remember I mentioned we cannot control the dorsal ventral axis of our embryos, although we can rotate them AP. Um, and uh, we can capture temporally arising features using both of these measures, which necessitates Again, precise time alignment, which I don't have time to tell you how we do, but it's a, really the crux of this project. Okay, so for cell count, this was very straightforward. We can just take and segment our data and, and um, isolate the, the number of endoderm, mesoderm, and ectoderm nuclei as the embryo is going through the process of development. And you can see that for control embryos, we have these beautiful reproduce, reproducible curves, and these can be neatly fit with parameters like midpoint, slope, and plateau. And then if we want to compare this for RNAi conditions, um, we can extract the same information. I just want to show you how useful just a single measure can be. So if we look at the plateau value, um, what I'm showing you on the top are seven different conditions um, that by eye look like they have some sort of problem in cell fate specification. And this is how the computer sees it, okay? So here I'm looking at the plateau value, the nuclear count. Uh, where I've subtracted off the wild type. So everything that's above this line represents an increase in a particular germ layer. Everything below this line represents a decrease in the germ layer. And hopefully you can see that these are sort of, some of these are sort of grouping out just based on this single parameter uh, for the three different colors. So um, just to draw your attention to the fact that there's a number of uncharacterized genes that are showing these phenotypes. We can also see that genes that are in the same pathway, such as WORM1 and LIT1, which are both Wnt signaling genes, and APH1 and APH2, which are both NOTCH, they show similar overall profiles just with this single um, feature. We can also see that some of the things that we might have called by eye as having potential cell fate defects are probably really cell positioning defects. So this single measure turns out to be quite useful. Okay, so moving on to morphogenesis, this turned out to be, require a bit more ingenuity. Uh, how do we measure changes in tissue position and tissue shape? We ended up using both broad and specific measures to capture these defects. Um, so if we start with a very broad measure, we look at um, the position of the tissues using center of mass or distance to center of mass. So here I'm showing you the long axis of the embryo and then we computationally rotate and look at the short axis of the embryo. And the pale dots are tracking the center of mass for either the red or green intensities. And these are being plotted in real time on the plots below. So if we look at a condition where you have a, a real morphogenesis phenotype, such as this ACDH12, the phenotype here is that 
the epidermis, which is in green, should be encasing the head and encasing those neurons, but the neurons actually spill out. Um, and you can see that that's being captured by our distance to center of mass measurement in the red. You can also see that the green is having really dramatic problems, but the trace is not showing much change here. And that's because the change we're seeing is not in the position, it's in the shape of this tissue. So how do we actually capture changes in tissue shape? So for this, we can turn to a concept from physics called uh, moment of inertia, which can be easily explained by this stick figure diagram. So here we have two gentlemen who have barbells. They have different shapes, but they have the same center of mass. If you imagine trying to rotate those barbells, uh, this guy's going to require much more effort. And this effort is measurable by a high moment of inertia than this gentleman who's, who has a lower moment of inertia. So if you swap out those barbells and replace that with uh, signal intensity in either the green or red channels, then you can see that um, we can track changes in shape over time for uh, either the long or short axis of the embryo. And we can do this in both the um, morphogenesis and the uh, germ layer reporter strain. Finally, I want to show you a specific measure that we look at. So that e the example I showed you earlier of the enclosure defect, um, that, that's a reasonably common phenotype we wanted to pick up um, more readily. And so what we do is we take the first third of the data and we computationally rotate and project it. And then we apply a binary mask, which allows us to measure the intensity of the sort of filled in mask area. So for that same example, you can see that the head enclosure defect is readily picked up using this uh, specific uh, feature. So the combination of these features together really gives us a, a good readout. Altogether, we have um, over 20, well, we have 25 feature curves. And again, we know, we understand what each one of these curves mean. So if we look at a given RNAi condition, we can see that certain tissues and certain aspects of development are going normal. And then we can see exactly which tissues at which time point are showing defects. Of course, the computer uh, needs to distill this down a little bit more so that we can do comparative analysis. The computer sees this data as parameters, so we parameterize these curves. I'm happy to talk about how we do that. Um, and we get a number of, um, we get 108 parameters from our 25 feature curves. And then the goal is to find uh, strings of numbers that look similar so that we can find con RNAi conditions that give overall phenotypes that are related. At this point, we have a number of choices to make. And the first is, well, how do we actually determine which uh, metric to use? How do we evaluate similarity between these phenotypic profiles? And then um, which of these parameters should we include? And then uh, you know, are, are, is our approach actually working? Do we, are we getting phenotypically similar conditions out in the end? And um, we start by normalizing these values and compare the phenotypic signatures. Um, as I mentioned, we want to keep this in continuous space. So we can Im imagine that each of these RNAi conditions have a unique position in n-dimensional space. So here I'm showing you three-dimensional space where each dimension represents one of our measured parameters. And uh, our, our RNAi of interest has a unique position. Of course, we're in 108-dimensional space, however. So then all, to, all we need to do to find our genes that have related phenotypes is look and see who's in the close proximity based on Euclidean distance in n-dimensional space. And um, when we do that, we see that in general this is true, that the, the genes that are closest to one another in n-dimensional space are in fact the most similar. But we noticed some interesting non-uniformity in this when we evaluated it relative to our manually annotated data. So what we saw is that phenotypic groups that we would pick out by eye as being very similar uh, look something like this. So if you have pretty mild phenotypes, uh, these phenotypes tend to be late in development. You have less stochasticity than you do if you have your arrest much earlier in development. Um, and so if we look at the real data on this, so he's, these are 17 different groups that we had manually annotated, and we look at, we're looking at how the computer is seeing them in n-dimensional space, measuring the distance to wild type versus the distance to the group average. And again, what you can see is you have this high stochasticity for early, um, arrest, or early arrested embryos and low stochasticity for embryos that get much further. This suggests that there's a temporal component here that could be at play in other data sets. If you are using Euclidean distance, it might be worth looking to see if you have this. For us, though, this is just kind of an annoyance because what it means is that the distance metric is not uniform for picking out genes that are in the same, uh, that have the same phenotype. 
So we need to actually correct for this. So again, our problem is that we believe A and B should be in the same group and C and D should be in the same group, but their distance metrics are really different from one another. We can correct for this by, oh, sorry, forgot to mention. So if we were to do a pairwise analysis of all of the genes in the data set and, and um, array them, we get this mess. It's not anything useful coming out. But um, if we simply correct by the distance to wild type using our metric, which we call phenotypic angle of deviation, um, we can transform this Euclidean distance data to something more useful where we start to get clusters emerging. Now this is still, this is pretty good, but it's still not awesome. And we wanted to have more clear clusters coming out. So again, we wanted to select uh, the parameters that would be the most useful for giving us the best discrimination. And so we start with all parameters and then we tried a variety of different methods, PCA, LDA, and a greedy hill climbing approach to um, figure out which, which parameters are the most optimal. And again, we used our manual groups to, to train and, and determine which uh, parameters are the most useful. And this is a bit complicated to go through, but suffice it to say, we're using our manual groups to do that evaluation. And so now we're using our PAD metric with 41 parameters. And so you might be wondering if this actually works. <laughs> so how does this work? So let's take a look and see how the computer sees things. So if we start with a gene of interest like MEX3, which gives a very striking phenotype, where you have all muscle nuclei, the top hits from the computer, the computer picks, are MEX5 and MEX6. This is very encouraging. These are in the same pathway. Um, another example from cell fate realm is that if we look at this one, which has a very different cell fate phenotype, this is an, a putative integrator complex component. Its top hit turns out to be another integrator complex component. And uh, its next best hit is a fact complex component. And these are all involved in RNA processing. And we've done some follow-up to show that many of the integrator complex components have this same phenotype. How about morphogenesis? So when we look at morphogenesis, Example here, we're looking at KBP3. This is actually a kinetochore associated protein. And um, if we look to see who the top hits are for KBP3, we see that these show very similar phenotypes. They have defects in the dorsal hypodermis and they rest at the same point. And we find that there's actually two additional kinetochore proteins that show the same phenotype, which suggests either kinetochore proteins have a secondary role during development or that this arrest point is associated with chromosome missegregation defects. Um, finally, I want to sort of leave you with a broader overview of how well this is doing. How well is the computer stacking up against our trained biologist? So again, we have a, a number of different test groups. So these are just four of those test groups represented here. Um, how the biology can look, biologists can look and see the difference between these quite easily. The computer, of course, sees things in n-dimensional space, so we can sort of cheat and project that n-dimensional space into two dimensions by using T-SNE plots. If we look at the TCD plot and we just label the different groups um, using colors, we can see that the computer is actually seeing these as uh, distinct areas in n-dimensional space. If we draw circles around that and label them, you can see actually how the computer is seeing the developmental process um, in n-dimensional space. So overall, I've told you that we built a high content screen to look at the 2,000 embryonic development genes. Um, and a computer vision method that allows us to detect biologically meaningful features. Um, we are in the process of figuring out how to distribute a lot of this information. If you have ideas on this, I would love to hear that. We have a lot of data, and I think many of you could use this data for developing uh, tools and resources, so please come talk to me. Um, I would like to end by just thanking the members of my team. So this work was all done in the lab of Karen Ugama and Arshad Desai. And I had this really fantastic team uh, with diverse talents. Um, much of the computational analysis was initiated by Renat Haliulin, who's now at Recursion. And um, the strains were built by Xiaohe Wang, and Stacey Ochoa helped do a lot of that manual analysis. And the other individuals here were instrumental in collecting many of, uh, much of that data. So thank you very much, and I will take questions. Questions? We could do that in two weeks. So I know worms are really well behaved, but still, whenever I have done an RNAi screen, we had huge problems with penetrance yes. uh, to sort first, right? Yep. How do you do that? 
<clears throat> Very good question. So for starters, we're doing RNAi by injection, which gives you better uh, reliability. So um, we piloted trying this with both injection, soaking, and feeding screens, and injection's by far the best. But you're absolutely right. So you do get many conditions where you have a phenotype in, say, three out of the five embryos. Um, what we do is we actually we use, um, so as you were watching the movies, you could see that the embryos, as they fully elongate, they start to spin within the eggshell. So that is, is movement. We use movement actually as a classifier for whether there is a phenotype. If the, if the worm gets to the point of movement, we sort of separate those out and say these ones don't have a phenotype. And we only analyze the ones that have a phenotype. Because, so if you try to average those together, you're going to really ruin your analysis. If you, we don't have a, enough N to have any statistical significance. So we separate those out and we say we'd rather not lose any useful information and analyze the phenotypes that we have. So yeah, we use movement as a classifier to distinguish uh, phenotype versus non-phenotype. And then we use um, medium, median values for all of the non-moving embryos as our, um, our parameter values. So, so do you care about the, the features that you're extracting or, or ultimately just about the, the grouping? Um, because it doesn't seem like you're doing like a lot of post hoc, like, oh, these three features were most useful for doing this kind of clustering for this RNAi versus another. So it seems like a lot of energy is going into extracting features when um, you don't seem to, to do a lot of downstream analysis of what, what those features seem to relate to. Yeah, I think that uh, that's sort of an issue of manpower on the project, <laughs> because I think we, we would like to be able to do that. And, but at this point, uh, all of those members of the team, almost all of them except for one, have since moved on to other, other <laughs> endeavors. And so it's left to me to sort of wrap up a lot of the work. Um, but you're absolutely right. I think there's a lot, that, a lot of um, information we could gain from that data by zeroing in a little bit more on each of the feature curves and seeing what they're predicting. Um, we're absolutely interested in, in sort of both applications of this, the, the sort of screen clustering effort, but also just using these as general tools for studying development and the, the usefulness of that for the field in general, I think, um, is worth devoting some time to, but we just haven't had the time to do that yet. Yeah. Uh, great talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so I, I was saying, like, currently this is based on, let's say, 75 genes and 10 groups, right? Uh, um, so that's just the, that's not, we're not training based on that. Yeah. So okay. that is, um, that's just a way of showing you, is it working or is it not working? Because I see that there's also potential that everything is right now being seen on n dimension, but we are always squishing into the lower linear yes. space. Yeah. But the data will be building a nonlinear space here. Yeah. What are your thoughts upon that? Because then your measurement of the distance and then the downstream or even all these uh, group, uh, group clustering will change because currently we are focusing on a lower, lower dimension. And I don't think RNA, as, as the single cell and everything is approaching, will say us everything is in the linear space. We will have to move to a nonlinear feature space. So how are your thoughts about that? Because this um, data is implementing, uh, showing that we are going into the nonlinear space here. It's giving a kind of indication that there is a nonlinear space already. So, because TSNE is also showing it's nonlinear, but it's showing in the linear subdomain. But if you look into the, all the other n dimensions, that might not give the same kind of uh, thinking. So, what are your thoughts on on that? If you amass the more genes and more data sets here. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so so in our case, we're we're less worried about actually putting things into groups and clustering them. Uh, we're keeping them in sort of um, who's the top hits in, in a rank order kind of um, uh, format so that we're not really implementing any boundaries. So I, those circles I was drawing at the end are sort of artificial. Um, but I think there's probably more to your question, and I'd have to think about a little bit more about how our TSNE plot is actually representing that n-dimensional space. I'm not sure, but I'd be happy to talk to you about it if you have some ideas. <laughs> 